All right, so I'm not quite sure how I want to do coverage of this round. Uh, I didn't feel I had quite the data or stuff to want to put together the fuller presenta presentations I've done, and I already did so much covering set over Stellial. So I thought what might be interesting is to show uh, one game from each of the other two matchups. So if you've watched the videos on my feed, you know uh, Delial and Seto tied their first game, a really interesting back and forth game. In the second game, Delial played brilliantly and attained a winning position and then misclicked to throw away the win, which was just devastating. And he ended up losing the third game, which Seto played really well. Um, Seto found a very good third move, but then Delial found a fantastic fourth move to uh, mitigate the pressure and escape to a tie. Seto made the natural and strong fifth move, but Delial had given himself a path to a tie, and then he just didn't play it. And I don't know. Whole situation there, very weird. And it should be noted, Delial was the last player of people I have a decent sample on to never make a mistake, move six or later. And this was his very first mistake there, which just very uncharacteristic. He's been so perfect from there that I think just a lot going on and tough to do. That said, we have two more matchups. Um, so I'm going to first show my matchup was Ups versus Asila. Uh, I was the first turn player here. This was game two of our matchup. And I was going with a three corner hand. The core idea of the hand was I have a very strong corner. And if they take it, I have recaptures. And not only do I have recaptures, but I'm ready to recapture that too, right? I have multiple ways to capture that from five and I have multiple ways to capture that from seven with different high numbers out facing. Similarly, if they capture my starter the other way, which they can't do, but pretend this captured, I can recapture, and I will have multiple recaptures from five and multiple recaptures from three. So kind of standard three-corner hand. Um, to say it again, I have the recapture here. I'm putting down their cards randomly. I have the recapture here. And then in my hand remaining, I will have a strong corner this way and a strong corner this way, which guarantees I'm likely to have kind of balanced directional strength remaining after the uh, initial cards come out of my hand. Further, I have some potential setups, right? If I start in 9 and then have a chance to play in 7, then 1898, eight, which was just my recapturer for 6, becomes my recapturer for 8 and potentially 4 as well. And similarly, if I get a chance to play in 3, my 8982, which was just the recapture for 8, becomes good in 6 as well. And while it's not quite as perfect in 2, is still um, a powerful card in 2 and has a backup there if needed. Uh, I have a video on three corner hands. It, I think it's called the Homer Hand or something. It's a good video. You should go back and find it if you are interested. Um, I think this is a, a very reasonable way, not very ambitious, but you're going to be able to build a pretty good hand on any single level rule set. And I couldn't find the rules. I haven't even talked about the rules. The rules was level nine, but you cannot use any cards with tens on them and no semis or rares. So you had this real prevalence of, do you want to use nine nines? Do you want to use nine eights? There are two nine eight, there are four eight nine eights available or eight eight nines. Do you want to use those? That's probably the most powerful option. But 9-8-7s feel like they have a lot of potential against 9s as well. Is 7-6-7-6 seven, six, seven, six good because it's so good versus 9s? Or is it not as good because without as many 10s running around as usual, it loses value? I thought there were lots of interesting questions, and I did not have a good answer to those questions. So what I settled on was, I will play a hand type that I know, A, I can use powerful cards. I can use the best 9-9 nine, nine corners, or what I thought were the best. I can use the best 8-9-8s, eight, and I can use an 8-9-7, and I can fit them together pretty well. Um, you'll notice one of the biggest weaknesses is I have two terrible numbers facing down, but I'm always or usually intending to play one of them first, and in my the rest of my hand, there is one weak number in each direction, so after my first play, my hand's going to be pretty balanced. Um, so I think all in all, this was like a reasonable way to build, not something super clever, not something where I thought I had figured out a real edge to the rule set, but something where I knew I could use powerful cards, I knew my hand made some sense, and really importantly, I knew my hand had a starter. I knew if I look at our hands and I can't find a plan, I have a go-to move, 
that is going to be at least okay. Against some opposing hands, it'll be really high pressure. Against some opposing hands, they'll handle it easily. But if I'm worried, I can play that as a starter and know my position's okay. Um, Asala, on the other hand, went with a four-corner strategy and utility cards. Um, honestly, I like their hand. Um, I had thought about using a hand of a ton of 9-8-7s, but when I started sort of thinking about the games, I felt they never played out well together. But I think Asala's cards ended up playing nicely and a version with two 987s and a bunch of other cards gave them more play than massing 987s altogether. Um, obviously can't speak so much to Aesila's hand choice. So in game one, I started here, and Aesila played here, setting up against the side they couldn't already take, and we played out a tie. I'll just give the moves to that. I got a little excited that I could play in one here, but Aesila goes in five, and I just have nothing, and we are headed for a tie. So that was game one. Um, game two, I had noticed that Aesila might not have this corner covered very well. They have nothing for two, and I thought, so I'll try this. I'll give them a different look. I'll do something a little different. I wasn't sure if I wanted to change my hand, but I thought they might have a little difficulty dealing with this corner. And I thought if they did a similar kind of play, setting up the same in two, in the last instance, I really had to block eight, because taking it with a nine out seemed such a powerful effect. Well, if I induced a similar kind of move here, their same in two has a very low number facing out, and I will have a ton of powerful things going up to fight it. And I thought this could put me in a good situation. If it turns out Aesila really likes adjacent corners that set up sames, I thought maybe I'd have a chance to exploit that. Now, it turned out in the match that Aesila played really varied replies to starters, um, and there wasn't some kind of exploit of, ah, you really like this type of play, I can try to make it just a little weaker, and if you still go for it, get some advantage. Didn't work at all. Not a useful strategy. What I thought was really cool here was Aesila noticed they had coverage of four, not coverage of two. I had coverage of both squares. But that means two is kind of a dead square for them. They also noticed that I don't have clean recaptures in four myself. Now they can't recapture in two, so they can't force a recapture in four. But it turns out if I just have to play in four at all, it's a little uncomfortable. So I thought they played an awesome move just going next to my starter, um, denying a square that I have play in and they don't. And just leaving me with what I thought was this really tough decision. I can certainly try to go in three with one of these cards, but they just, like, take me, lock in a card. I still can't take two. I'm probably fine here. Like, I probably get a tie going in nine, because that's safe. But, like, I'm groveling for a tie there. That's very unpleasant. Um, and that I might not be having a tie there. I'm not sure. I think there's a good chance at least one of those moves tie, but there's also a good chance neither do. If I do something like this, um, I take it, but, like... There are two cards available for them to attack. It's hard for me to defend them. I don't know, man. I, I just, I really didn't like the look of this. And the main point is, what do I put in four? If I put something like this in four, I'm just walking into a same. That looks miserable. So I was thinking of putting this in four, because this is the complex, interesting option. We both have nine, seven, one, nine, which is a same in five, and a plus wall in seven. And at first I thought, I'm on first turn. I'll get last turn. If I leave those two squares open, that card is going to dominate. It's going to combo everything. But there are two reasons this is bad thinking here. One is, they haven't flipped four yet. So if we play over on the right side of the board, and their last turn, if they have left this card open as well, they're going to have two cards left. Their other card probably won't flip four. It might flip something else, and suddenly my big move in seven right? I want to play this card in seven. Obviously, I picked up their card. But my big play in seven won't matter because it won't hit anything. They won't have flipped it. And so I thought one thing is those squares look good for me, but I'm not actually guaranteed any combo at all in seven if I leave these open. So I've got to be really careful about it. And second of all, I think they can go here. And I think what happens here is I have no moves. I can't combo now. They combo back in the other square. I can't block here, because then they combo in five, and I have no combo back elsewhere. I can't capture their card in 
three because that would use up my big combo card and then they can combo freely and I am dead. And it's really hard to waste a move. I probably have to try to th chuck something in eight or nine just to try to waste moves. But then it comes back to the other problem. If I leave five and seven open, it isn't actually that good for me. If one of my one eight nine eight or seven three nine eight had something to do in six, maybe this would be fine. But they have nothing. And so I realized, I, I think this move's probably losing, and it's the move I wanted to make. And the two other cards I could block four with, I cannot take back from seven. My hand was good at taking back itself when it started in nine and built around that, but it is not good at taking itself back when I start in one, trying to exploit a weakness in their hand. So I just thought Aesila's move in two was superb. Um, it really made me so uncomfortable. I ended up playing 1898 and 4, and Aesila, I think, correctly just took it, just going, you can't take back. I chose 1898 over 7398 because I wanted to lock my card in. I didn't want to deal with what happens if they take it. I probably can. Maybe I can do a move here. Maybe I can even do a move like here, um, but it doesn't set up much. Maybe something like here, maybe I can get away with. I can probably get away with this. Probably. Not 100% sure. But I wanted to block four, and I kind of hoped they wouldn't just take me. But he did just take me, and why not? And here, I had sort of... I knew I didn't have anything in seven. I hoped I had something in three or nine. I wasn't sure which. I ended up settling on this, and I did calculate it out correctly with the point that if they take me, I take, I'm safe. The one saving grace to my play was the 9719 is always safe in 9 in every line we looked at against their hand. And my 9927 is guaranteed a capture at the end. So I got a tie, but I thought Aesila's first move just did an awesome job of putting me in a really tough situation that I, I, I felt extremely uncomfortable here and was relieved to get out of the game. I ended up winning the third game after switching out the 7398. Um, I thought one big problem here was uh, I would love, for instance, in this game to be able to just take from three with not a nine facing down. And so one of my ideas was if I switched that seven, three, nine, eight, I switched it to a seven, two, eight, nine was just then I could play that in three and they don't have good ways to take it from um, six without being comboed. So I thought it might help in this line and it also might help in the lines after this. I thought it was a switch that could just apply just a little more pressure. And I think in general, um, just thinking about cards, I think this card is a little more powerful than this card. I think when the big number is flanked, I talked about this watching the Seto Deli match, it's just a little more powerful. And here the big number isn't flanked and I switched to a card where it was. So I thought that was an interesting game. Um, I, I did end up winning the next game, but it wasn't nearly as uh, nicely played a game. I think the best move of the match was uh, Aesila's move here, and could have easily knocked me out. Sweet move, great game. Uh, now, I don't quite have it ready to talk about, but let's look at the um, the DJ Midas game. Uh, again, if you want to watch uh, Set Over Steli All, there is ample, ample stuff to watch that. Uh, this game was messy. This game was complicated. This game was difficult. This game was not perfectly played, and that's okay. Uh, but this game was messy, and I think the players made really interesting decisions in a tough position. I looked at this a bit when it happened, but I haven't looked at it since, so I'm thoroughly unprepared to do a competent job on this video. Um, but we can see both players chose the 1898 and the 8982. Um, the one thing Aesila didn't do was choose these cards, and I think they are the most powerful available. Uh, DJ, who was our first turn player, made the really interesting choice of these opposite 9954s. Opposite cards obviously play really well together, but it's only if there are more of the numbers on them to take. Because inherently, when you play this here, this cannot take it back from any direction. Right? In no rules, exact opposite cards play terribly together. The thing that makes them play well together is if there's further cards that can go in other squares that they can play off, and then suddenly sames can get set up. You know, 
Actually, that was a terrible example, but something maybe more like this. But even then, there's not that many nines facing in the directions where they play off each other that well. So I instinctively thought this would play badly, but I'm not sure it actually did in, in, in play. Um, DJ started in two, um, which is a curious move because he does not have both one and three covered. And normally moves here, you know, it's nice to have covered. And in fact, Midas with the seven, six, eight, six is better coverage of nines facing down. In the end, though, I think it's I think it's a reasonable move. Midas played a far away corner. It's interesting how hands are so much more calibrated usually to take nines than eights, that having eights facing out can be pretty powerful. Um, DJ made another move I found quite odd. But it sets up 9945 to have both 3 and 5. But I'm not sure why D Midas can't just take the in-between square. I think this would have been really good. Um, Midas decides to leave those squares open because he also has 9945. He goes in 1, which I think wasn't precise, but now we still have a very difficult position for DJ. Um, let's just pop out the solver. Three moves tie here, and none of them are taking the square in 3. He cannot occupy 3. Even though he can do so without walking into combos, the problem is Midas still sames, and there's there's nothing here. It's just a loss. So you can't go in three, which is the obvious square to go in. It is scary as hell to go in five here, because you give up three forever. Now, the AI is telling me there are two miracle saves in five, but oh my god, what a, like, you have to make a move like this? What are we doing? This looks horrible, right? Now, the point is, you've set up this combo in 8, right? So if they do take this, we actually have play. But, oh, what a what a horrible type of move to have to find. I think, in practice, DJ made the best move. Because I think the moves in 5, like, are a nightmare to find. DJ plays here. He grabs a card. He can be comboed. But, you know, if something like this is taken, then he can take 3. And if he can take three, you know, he gets just enough to hold the tie. So he gives up the combo in five, but that's okay. If DJ takes three, well, I mean, if Midas takes three, the blue player, DJ has five, and he'll be okay. Um, now here, there's lots of pads to a tie, but Midas picks a um, very sensible move. Seven, six, eight, six, and seven. And we actually have a really huge problem for DJ here, which is 9945 is the key card for both squares. So you really want to play 4599 here, but it gets comboed and you actually don't combo anything back. You have this plus with two nines out facing, but it doesn't matter. So you can't go there. If you go in three, I mean, you just don't take enough, you know? So really horrible looking position and DJ did go in three here and ended up losing. Uh, this was the game continuation. But actually, um, and maybe someone watching this spotted it, DJ has a save here. And not only does he have a save, uh, Midas' move was a mistake. And DJ could have won here. But it's so easy in a position like this to think it's not working and not just check everything. But there is a miracle save here. And give a little more time to find it, but I'm going to show it. Goes in five. Weird, right? But the point is, this combos too much, right? It combos five, which combos eight, which combos nine, which combos four. And that means this is going to combo everything back. It's going to hit six. Sorry, which combos six? It's going to hit six, which hits five, which hits eight, which hits nine. Six, four, win. And if Midas goes in three, well, he has to do the combo card if he wants to not just lose. But then DJ has the combo here, and again, this whole chain happens. So I think this is really hard to see, because you have to see you're giving up this huge combo, right? But you're guaranteeing that you get to combo back. I think as, like, three moves left go, this is about as complicated as it gets. A very interesting position, really complex game. I'm sorry I didn't uh, spend more time on it. Uh, as I hadn't prepared at all to talk about it, because I 
honestly forgot that I hadn't covered it already. I felt like I had, because when it happened, I thought about it a bit, and I that made me, in my brain, I decided, well, I've talked about it. Hadn't talked about it, so didn't adequately prepare. This would be a great game if other people want to dive in and uh, analyze a bit, because I think it's very interesting and a lot of combo potential. Um, but Midas advances on that to the finals, and I think well played. Like, he could have lost here, but I think overall he... Uh, he had the advantage in this game and applied pressure nicely. Um, so our three finalists are myself, who's up, uh, Seto and Midas. And uh, good luck to them. Good luck to me. I probably won't be doing Road to the Finals videos for them because I, I am feeling weird about the whole competitor while doing commentary thing. And I don't really know how to explain that weirdness. But I'm excited about the matchups. I think I will make a video of me talking through hand ideas for one of it, because people have asked in the past for talking about building hands, and I think it's a really interesting rule set I've got, and also I have, like, this morning I worked on hand ideas, and I came up with, I believe, 12, and I'd just like to go through them and what I was thinking for each one. Um, and probably none of them are the finished product. You'll see when I put up a video about the games of the finals. Um, but maybe some of them are. But I wanted to get down sort of what I was thinking, or want to get down. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to record that shortly. And uh, I hope you're excited for the finals, uh, and that the coverage so far has been interesting.